Welcome to another episode of the People Over Perks podcast by Leapsum. I'm Andy Parker and I'm your host. In each episode, we have a people operations or HR leader come on the show and tell us their behind the scenes secrets as to how they're building a high performance culture in their organization. In this episode, we talk to Crystal Farrens Lee, the Chief People Experience Officer at ProxyClick. We talk about how she's creating a consistent employee experience across their global offices, her career advice for people looking for their first role as a leader in the people operations function, and the differences between working in HR in a corporate versus a startup or a scale up. Enjoy the show. Okay, Crystal, thank you for joining us today on the, the People Over Park Perks podcast. Happy. Happy and, uh, and so where, whereabouts in the world are you right now? Uh, so I'm based out of Antwerp, which is a city in Belgium, uh, out north of Brussels. That's where I live. Um, and I'm calling you from home. Nice. And, and that is where ProxyClick's head office is as well, right? So ProxyClick is headquartered in Brussels, absolutely, in Belgium with offices in Singapore, New York, and a number of people who work remotely. And we've all been remote since March, pretty much. So but yeah, that's our headquarters. Yeah, ex- absolutely. Um, obviously, the, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused uh, complications for, uh, for all of us, hasn't it? But we'll, we'll come back to that uh, in a bit. And so, um, so you are the, the Chief People Experience Officer uh, at, at ProxyClick. Can you give us an overview as to what ProxyClick is and also how you describe your role there? Sure. So ProxyClick is a B2B SaaS, basically. Um, it's a cloud-based software used by enterprises like L'Oreal, PepsiCo, Audi to transform how their employees, visitors, and contractors are welcomed in their corporate offices around the world. And we're making that whole journey seamless and safe from start to finish. Uh, we originated as a more of a visitor management system, but again, with COVID in the current environment, we've been able to kind of expand our product out to, to look out for employees as well. Okay, interesting, thank you. And, um, and uh, with regards to your role, how, how do you describe your role? Um, yeah, the Chief People Experience Officer. I sometimes call myself the C3PO because it's the Chief of People, Passion and Performance. So maybe that's a quick way of doing it. I think like fundamentally <laughs> my role is to help us understand uh, performance, uh, the people's experience, just how they come to work and experience work. And, you know, we're, we're a startup, we're a scale up. So we really want people to be passionate about what we're doing because that fuels the engine for growth. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. And, um, and so, so jumping back to the beginning of your career, um, what made you get into HR in the first place? I wish I had a really like deliberate answer for you, but I don't. Um, circumstances and opportunity, I think. So my background is uh, in international relations and women's studies. Um, I'm Canadian and I ended up in um, London. And it just so happened, I was kind of trying to figure out what the opportunity is when you do a studies like that, it doesn't necessarily lead to an obvious job. And I found myself in the city in London uh, and it was really looking for a job, like you say like that. And they were looking for an assistant in training and development at Goldman Sachs in a you know, big US investment bank. And that's how I kind of started in training and development and, and went and grew from there. And if you look back on it, it makes sense in terms of all the things I'm interested in. Um, but it was really, yeah, coincidental in a way. And so, so tell me more about that. When you say it's, uh, it, it adds up from the, uh, in, in terms of the things you're interested in, what, what do you mean by that? Um, so I think, the, you know, I, in my undergraduate, I studied uh, women's studies, which is sort of the gateway into thinking about diversity, inclusion. And so that's kind of the red thread. If I think about my career and what I'm passionate about, it's something that's always really been very important to me. So uh, a large part of my time at, at Goldman Sachs was spent doing global leadership and diversity. So working on diversity inclusion, this is kind of a while ago, this is almost, well, it's more than 10 years ago, um, just to put it in context of where we are today. And then on top of that, I was just always interested in a lot of things about people. I was a theater kid. Um, so I was comfortable with public speaking, storytelling, all these kind of creative things. And when you think about people in a company, you're talking about everybody's story everybody's individual narrative and how they're putting that together they're all characters are on their own stage and experiencing things so that's just naturally interesting to me and a large part of my work back then and still today is thinking about the message thinking about what you want people to take away and experience and and that yeah I think that that all kind of goes back to thinking about theater communication storytelling those kinds of things excellent thank you thank you for that and um and so obviously, yeah, as you mentioned, you spent many years at Goldman Sachs, um, a huge, huge organization, obviously. Um, and, and remind me, how, how large is ProxyClick right now? 
<laughs> well, at the beginning of the year, we were about just under 50. And today we're about 82. So we've doubled uh, over in, in a year. So we're still small, but for us, it's quite a big jump. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. And um, so I, I'm curious as to, you know, obviously your experience in um, the, the sort of large enterprise versus, um, you know, smaller, um, you know, hyper growth companies, as it were. Um, what sort of things did you take from your experience at Goldman Sachs that you could then apply into these roles in smaller companies versus the things that you had to relearn? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's often a debate when you're working in a startup about do you want folks that are coming from larger companies or do you want people who just are starting in startups because there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. For myself, um, what the great thing about working at Goldman and I don't think Goldman's a typical big company because it was actually relatively small relative to its competitors. Um, and it is a company that is very demanding of its people in terms of what it expects from a performance point of view. So the benefit for me was you really learn discipline. You really have an incredibly strong foundation of skills early on in your career when you're learning very quickly about mm -hmm. what's expected at a high level of professionalism, execution, excellence, attention to detail. I mean, I remember sitting with someone when I was just starting and they could point out when I had too many spaces in my email and they'd suggest that I go look up every full stop in my sentence to make sure I had the right spacing. I mean, that was the level of attention you would have. And I think, well, today that doesn't necessarily feel practical for where I sit, mm -hmm. that foundation, that discipline, that rigor, I think pays in spades later on in, in, in your career, in your life. So I, I give a lot of credit to my time there to, to build that, that, that robustness, that rigor. You also get to learn a lot about structure, about what a process should look like how important it is to kick something off, how to do a debrief. Um, you learn a lot about stakeholder management. So realizing it's not just, especially in a people zone, doing what your manager tells you, there's all these other people involved in things. So I think that's what I really took away. Of course, they also have excellent access to resources. So you, you get training, you get development. Um, they're not thinking about budget in the same ways as, as some smaller companies have to. So that's, that's what I would say is what I, I learned. And what's interesting is, you take that and you can kind of go two ways. You can kind of say, that's how something should be done. And you try and replicate that everywhere. Yeah. But what's interesting is when you go to a much smaller company and, and a startup hyper growth company, um, in the very beginning, you, you, you don't maybe need all of that structure. And then as you're scaling, you start to need structure, but how much of it do you need? So for me, what I was what I, I have been able to do is take the structure that I learned from this larger organization and then you kind of test the walls and you say, okay, what's a supporting beam that has to be there? There's a really good reason for it to be there. And what's there that, I don't know, it, it doesn't really need to be there. And so you start to pull things out until you're left with kind of the bare minimum process you need. Yeah. And then you can, you know, have a lot more flexibility and agility around that. So I, for me you know, to do what I'm doing now in, a, in more of a scale up situation that foundation is super important because then I know what to take away. Whereas it's, I think if I had gone in without knowing that, I, would, I wouldn't know what, what, what has to be there and what has to be taken away. And it would be much more of a guess and test, I think. Excellent. Interesting. Thank, thank you for that. And, um, and so, so throughout your experience, would you say that you have developed a particular specialty within, within HR or um, obviously now you're operating as the, the leader? And so I, I imagine, you know, you covered all topic areas, but... Um, yeah, would you say that you, you have, a, have a specialty, so to say? So I started more with the specialty. I started in, in training and development, and, and which brings a lot of project management skills. And then, as I, I mentioned, I spent a lot of time in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's kind of my core specialty. Um, in a scale-up, you, you kind of do have to be a jack-of-all-trades in terms of touching everything from comp to, to training to recruitment. Mm -hmm. um, what I think my specialty is, is I'm, I'm maybe not the, a great static operational HR business partner profile. I'm much more excited. I think I do better work when I'm creating and I'm building and I'm scale, which is why scale ups and, and, and startups are so interesting because I really love this momentum and this adrenaline that comes from, from building something and navigating it when it's all sort of steady state, then, then for me, it's, it becomes less interesting. So not so much a specialization in a field, but more a specialization in where I think my work is most useful and most meaningful to, to an organization. Yeah. So it's much more about the, the stage and the, the sort of the, the type of organization that, 
um, will benefit from your skill sets and also where you feel most comfortable and at home. Yeah, I love it when there's nothing or I love it when there's something or I like it when it's broken and needs fixing. If it's all running and ticking along, then I'm like, well, what do you what do you need me for in a way? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Interesting. Thank you. And, um, and so also, um, obviously, you're now in the, the chief people experience officer role, um, but you've also held a number of very senior level HR roles in, in your previous companies as well, but all with slightly varying job titles. Yes. Um, can you walk me through, you know, what those previous roles were and how you see the differences between them? Well, I think, I mean, I'm going to assume you're talking more to the startup roles that I did as opposed to the larger yes. company roles. Um, exactly. Yeah. I guess first, I'm not sure there's so much in the title. I'm kind of one of these people that, okay, I need a title to make it sort of digestible for others, but I, I'm not very limited by the title. Um, I'm sort of self-driven in that way. But I, I think when I joined Ubico, which was a, at that moment in time, it was starting up and it scaled very quickly, very fast. Um, in most of these situations, there was never a head of people. There was just no one looking out for that. So in all three of the roles, I was the first one to come in and say, okay, it's time to do something in this space. What do we do? And what we decided at Ubico was head of people and culture. In all cases, we wanted to avoid the word HR. Maybe that's the, the, the golden rule from all of these roles. And, and, and why, why, why is that before we move on? It, had a, it has a connotation for, for a lot of startups of feeling more conservative, more traditional, more like rubber stamping your time off. Mm -hmm. which I'm not sure it's fair, but that's, um, it's, it's a kind of a way of breaking with tradition, I suppose. And at Ubico was head of people and culture because for them, the founders at that time, culture was super important. They were much more interested in how I was gonna preserve culture as they scaled versus thinking about things like performance management and training. And of course, those go hand in hand, but they were really driven about try being able to take their spirit as founders and spreading that across the company through culture. So that was why it was sort of people and culture. Um, I moved to a company called Sentience and they were looking for a VP of people. And that's basically, it was people and, and everything that kind of went with it from, you know, the nuts and bolts, the recruitment, the performance management, but also the culture as well. But it was um, more of a high tech. It was like 70% software engineer based. Um, so a bit more niche. And, and my role was sort of more general sounding to the people. And then where I am right now, it, it's funny, I, I kind of got to make up my title. Um, I came in thinking head of people and, and I was sort of told, no, you have to be a chief of people. I said, okay. Um, and as I said, I, I, liked, I would call myself the C-3PO, but because I, I'm very tongue in cheek about this stuff, but of course in the external world, you have to be a bit more serious. And I, I like the term people experience because um, I don't always feel that it's our role to be responsible for culture. I think we can help guard it and nurture it, but culture is something that, that blooms from everyone. It's not my job alone. So I, I kind of avoided that. Um, people could have worked, but I, I really like the idea of people experience because at ProxyClick, we're really focused on people having an experience. You know, we recognize people will come and people will go, but we want their time there to feel nutritious and full. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like that. And, um, and in each of those roles, did you always report directly into the founders? I have, yes. You have, interesting. Okay, and so, um, so yeah, I mean, it sounds, sounds to me like you, uh, you, you've really kind of, um, you know, taken on a very similar role in these, these three, uh, three organizations. And um, when you've joined each of them, um, have you had like a, a playbook as such that you like to roll out in terms of the processes that you implement? Or, you know, what, what does your first, I don't know, sort of three to six months look like when you, when you join those businesses? Well, and it changes, right? Because to be honest with you, when I started at Ubico, I had never done it before. So I was um, really <laughs> figuring it out as I go and kind of indeed going back to the playbook of, of my time at, at places like Goldman and saying, okay, what did we do then? And how would that work here? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, what you, what's super different is in a large company, there's resources you can go to. There's a specialist on all sorts of things. And in a startup, there's just you. So yeah. you learn to be entrepreneurial and pragmatic really quickly. And then as I, as I um, moved, you, you can kind of internalize that previous experience. So you have a bit of a skeleton. I think that the trick though, is not to um, assume the playbook because then you end up repeating exactly the thing of what traditional big companies might do if you kind of just put this framework on top of a, a top of an organization. And a lot of these companies, when you're joining, 
they have a culture, they kind of know what they want, but maybe they haven't articulated it yet. So you're trying to extract it out from what you see. So my first, like my first one to two months is I just talk to everybody. I literally just do like a tour and I'm talking to everybody about what is this place? What do they expect from me? Um, recognizing that there almost always isn't a really clear job description on this role. So my big one is, what do you expect from me? What do you think I'm going to do? What should I be doing? And mm -hmm. I'm kind of calibrating that as I go. Um, and at the same time, trying to introduce what I think my role is. And I often describe it as glue. I'm like, I'm like people glue. I'm kind of here to make everything stick as it's going on so quickly. Um, and that's glue for people and their managers, managers to managers, founders to people, wherever it is. So I, I'm kind of everywhere. And, and goopy, you know, I can't, there's no clean place that I can sit. And that's sort of how I see my role. And I also feel like that role only works if people trust you. So, and that comes with time. So everything I say, whatever process we, we put together, if we don't have credibility and trust, then it, it, it just isn't going to work. And I tell people that. So um, that's uh, no playbook per se, but it always starts from there. And as I'm learning what that culture is, then I'm trying to figure out from the various tools and ideas I have, what would work, what wouldn't work, what's expected. And it, it is really different every time because if you start with the culture, even if you're rolling out the same performance management process, you have to adapt it to the people in those seats and the structure. And again, that's, mm -hmm. that's where scale-ups are maybe different from larger organizations where the organization sits and the people fit in it. In scale-ups and startups, you start with the people as, and then you have to kind of adapt this organization to work for that. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, and you know when uh when you when you've joined these companies, you know, have you are they have you experienced um very common challenges across them all, or are there any any themes that you could say that you could pull out um, yes. that you've had to help all of them navigate through? Yes, very much so. Um, probably the number one is they always think they're hiring me to help recruitment because they're thinking about growth. Okay. And when you ask them about, you know, retention or culture, they'll tell you our culture is fine. All of that's fine. We, we need a, we need someone to grow our team. Yeah. And, and they tend not to realize that that growth automatically affects the whole experience throughout. So that's the number one thing is they think they just want that. And I know actually you need, you're going to, if you want to go that way, there's all this other stuff to take into account. So that's, that's always the case with, with any, startup or scale up, they, they think they just want a recruiter, but in fact, they, they need to think about the whole people experience. That's one. Um, and I, and I think again, there's that, uh, that balance of structure of what's appropriate for which company at that moment in time and, and adding in and taking out. Um, and what that structure should be will be different for each of them. But uh, I think moving to structure in itself is a theme that they all have the, the discomfort of that. Because then it's, you know, does it start to become bureaucratic? Is it replacing some, some kind of magic je ne sais quoi that they had before? Um, so founders or CEOs, they, they're they struggling to hide, have this vision and how to make that sort of practical. So that's a general theme. And then almost in all cases, you end up recruiting senior leaders into your company. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you not change culture, but culture moves, right? You added something to it. And it always when you're bringing people in, there's this moment of that new person comes in and they're trying to navigate this company that they thought they understood when they interviewed, but now that they're here, it's a bit different. So I'm often playing that glue role with them, trying to help them navigate, how to help the company navigate them. And that's something that I've consistently seen across all of these roles. Okay, thank you. And, um, and so really when you, know, you, you talked about being the glue within the organization, um, are there any like specific metrics or like things that you are looking at on a really frequent basis that help you know that you're heading in the right direction and know that you are being successful in your role? Yeah, um, probably not as many metrics as I would like. But again, often the numbers are very small. So you have to be careful with a lot of small numbers that they're, they're swaying things. Mm -hmm. um, definitely probably the most important one is some kind of engagement metric. So whether, you know, there's pulse surveys that can run every week or every month, you have to kind of know for your company if that's, if that gets diminished returns because people feel like it's too repetitive. Yeah. Um, we've tended to go quarterly because I think I can, I can build enough momentum around that moment and it's frequent enough. And we pay a lot of attention to the comments and you know the ENPS and things like that as a way to kind of measure the experience over time. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's probably a really important metric. Of course, recruitment metrics are always really important in terms of, um, yeah, how fast you're moving, how many acceptances you're getting, whether you get them, um, you know, ideally you're looking at kind of the level of diversity in your talent pool, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're too small to be kind of measuring things like cycles of promotion or number of tenure. Or people will say, how long do I spend in this role before I can move? Those answers are really hard to give yeah. when, when you're newer. Um, so probably other batch of numbers I would look at is we look at turnover. Uh, it's also a really tricky one because when you scale, I'm not always sure it's realistic to expect 100% retention as you scale. You will have people that blossom and do best at early stage, and you will have people who um, do best at scale, and, and that might not be the same person. And that doesn't mean it's a failure of them or a failure of the company. That's just how that curve tends to work. So you think you have to be careful with turnover to hold it with a bit of grain of salt to where you are as a growth company because you can't think of yourself like a a standard stable state company. That said, um, the the turnover itself is one number, but then the, the one I'm always interested in is kind of real attrition, real retention. So basically if you have a bunch of people at the beginning of the year, how many of those people are still here at the end? Because turnover just measures who's coming and who's coming out, but they're kind of, whether it's Joe that came in or Amy that left, it doesn't really matter. But when you're looking at real attrition, you're wanting to know if Joe has been there four years is still there. And that's a really interesting thing, especially if one of your goals is culture retention. Do people feel like this place is still there? So that's a number I, I tend to look at. Okay, that makes sense. And I, and I assume in, uh, in many cases, those early employees who have helped shape the culture very early are, you know, the, the kind of the constant rocks as such as the, as the, the culture continues to, to move and develop. Yeah, yeah, you hope so anyways. It's not always the case, but you hope so. Yeah, excellent. Um, and, uh, and so you, you touched on um, measuring engagement metrics and, mm-hmm. and you said that, uh, you know, you're, you're running quarterly surveys as your kind of preferred cadence. Yeah. Um, what does your process look like for taking those results and turning that into some sort of an action plan, um, you know, with things to then improve on? You know, I kind of feel like I feel a little bit guilty some of these answers I, I'm giving because I know when I was in a big company and we talk about what you do with metrics and how you should look at them and all of this stuff. I know all of that. And again, I sometimes I'm consciously rejecting those because as much as I just told you that we look at engagement metrics, it's much more art than science in a way, right? Because um, things are moving so quickly. And then take this, take the world today. Like it's it's naive to think that the externality of COVID is not affecting how people are putting those numbers in, even on a question that should be isolated from, from, from COVID, but they, of course they influence. In other words, that's to say, we, we look at the numbers. I'm always more interested in the Delta. So, you know, I understand that a lot of my, my, my CEO, for example, he has a target ENPS he wants to see, and I get that, but I'm much more interested to see how the thing moves. Well, what's the volatility on the experience? And if we're on a slow up or are we flat, that's interesting to me. And then the other thing is our um, engagement survey allows qualitative comments. And so that's, that's the gold. I always say that's where you really can kind of hear what's on people's mind. And the tool we have today allows us to respond. So we can respond to all of those comments individually and anonymously. And I think, you know, part of the value of doing the engagement survey is the fact that we do that. We, I read every comment. I don't answer all of them, but we acknowledge a lot and we answer and I pick up. And, and my goal is one day I want some, it happened at one of my companies where someone would just say, by the way, this is Bob, because they just felt they could just say who they were and this was the vehicle to do it as opposed to everyone feeling it had to be anonymous. So, um, you know, that data is important, but it's kind of what's underneath the data that's interesting. Uh, we also have a like a performance development process. And again, it's about trying to understand how people are doing and the same thing. I'm always, I'm not really interested if someone was meeting expectations or if they need a bit of help. I'm much more interested in the Delta from, from quarter to quarter. Okay, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then when, when you're looking at the, um, the, the, um, the qualitative comments, um, do you kind of like theme them and batch them and then sit down, I don't know, with, maybe with the founders or your team and review, you know, the, uh, the kind of the outlook for the company and then uh, and, and build some, uh, some initiatives around that? So all the managers in the team have access to their own team and the expectation is that they will go in there and look themselves and address themselves because you know that's that's their job and the CEO also reads through everything and answers everything and that was the case both where I am today and in my previous company because I think that is a huge part of what this experience is. I mean someone once got an answer said I didn't realize you actually 
answer this. And I didn't realize the CEO would answer it. So I think that's, um, that's one way we do it. So everyone is, it's clear that that's something they need to pay attention to and they do it. They go and they look and they pay attention and they're often pinging me going, can we talk about this thing that I see here and what it means, which is great. Um, I look at them, the, the tool is kind of already putting these things into themes and categories for us to an extent. Um, I put together a synthesis every quarter to kind of say, here are the top level things. Here are the things that are kind of concerning. Here's the things that we're always seeing. And these are the changes. And, and yeah, where, we can, where there's an action plan that we can do to address it, um, that's what we do. Uh, I find sometimes that as you're doing these, depending on the state of the world, of course, uh, that, that sometimes there isn't a whole lot of action you can do that you're not already doing. And, and I also think it's not about putting band-aids on things. It's thinking mm -hmm. more holistically about the solution. But yeah, there's every quarter a synthesis and a summary and a discussion of where we are. And, uh, and you, you mentioned at the start that ProxyClick has multiple offices all over the world. Um, how, how are you thinking about building a consistent employee experience across those different geographies? That was a really hard question to, to, to um, give you a succinct answer to. Um, because I think it's, you said the word consistent people experience. And I think that's a good choice of words. Because I think sometimes when we're tackling this, the question is, is it about giving people the same experience or an equivalent experience or a like for like? And that's that's important to kind of understand what are you giving all your people and why do you give them? And, and so, for example, things like uh, performance development, feedback, um, those kinds of things should absolutely be consistent no matter what your contract or your setup is, right? Um, in terms of if you're in the office and there's a free lunch or a yoga class, is that about something you have to somehow replicate for all of the different situations or, or not? And I think that begs, you know, I think there's sometimes debate of, yeah, everybody should get the same, but I think you have to go one step further and saying, why are you giving those things? And based if the why means that you need to give something different to another population than you should. Um, and I think the exchange is you should be clear about that. You know, if you can explain the reason I offer this when you're in the office, but I offer that when you're not is because the objective is the following. And I think we, it's our job to be clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it because otherwise people could get confused, but it doesn't necessarily mean everyone, if there's a, a lunch in the office on Friday. It doesn't mean everybody is getting some kind of lunch by themselves every Friday because I don't think it meets the same objective. Um, but in terms of consistency, it's, we're trying. I think this is not something that um, in the past we've done as well as we could. We're trying to improve that. I think COVID has been a really good kick in the butt to do that better in terms of um, being more consistent because all of the folks that we're used to in office are suddenly knowing life as a remote worker. So there's mm -hmm. a lot more empathy, I think, for how it is to be on a call and be the only one you know, not in the room and things like that. Um, but the, the nuts and bolts in terms of getting feedback, being managed, that should absolutely be consistent. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe that's a good segue to talk about the pandemic. Um, you, uh, you joined ProxyClick back in April, I believe? Early March, early March. Uh, early March, okay. So um, yeah, obviously just when, uh, when things really started to, uh, to, uh, to take a turn for the worse. Um, and so what has that experience been like for you and how, you know, what are the, like, obviously there are the remote challenges um, in, and, you know, what, what are the, maybe perhaps some of the, um, the non-obvious things that you have had to, uh, had to, had to face as a challenge as well. And how have you navigated that as a, as a business? That's a very large question. Um, so yes, I started two weeks before COVID kind of really took off. And so two weeks after I started full time, I sent everybody home. Um, and I think at that moment, there might have been a few people that thought I was overreacting mm -hmm. um, in terms of they didn't, we didn't necessarily understand what this was or how big a deal it was going to be. And we have a lot of sort of younger folks in our team. So they were like, well, we're fine. We're good. We're healthy. And I'm like, it's not about you. It's about you know, our citizenship and our responsibility for spread. So we were we were early movers in terms of sending people home and Knock on wood, luckily, that was the right call when you look back on it. And did you um, do that at all, like, for all locations at the same time? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Pretty much said everybody goes. And yeah. um, it was very interesting to start a role in that time because, of course, how do you meet the people when you can't meet the people? So um, on the one hand, it was much harder to, as I said before, when I start a role, I'm talking to everybody and I'm trying to understand suddenly there's this sort of limitation in a way of being able to reach out and absorb the informalness of, of proxy click. 
at the same time, because this is happening, it really focuses you as a, a people professional to say, okay, these are, this is clearly a people well-being issue. Everyone, there's no doubt about your seat at the table right now. What are you supposed to do? So it really um, helped me not get distracted by other things, right? Like I like to be liked. So one of the things when you start a new role is you're trying to figure out, do people like me or not? And now I didn't have time for that because I'm too busy trying to make sure we're making the right call for society, for the team, for people's well-being. So in that sense, the, the silver lining was, um, I got focused really quickly about the priorities for our people. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was super intense. I think at least we're largely in Europe. So I think the, the States was a little bit delayed uh, in terms of where they were on that, on that curve, but we were, everybody was at home. Everyone was with their kids and everyone was trying to cope with this through March, April, May, very, very intense in terms of thinking of what the people experience look like. And, and we, um, with such a generous management team, honestly, in terms of, you know, we could see Zoom fatigue, we could people see just being fed up, stuck in their chair. And we were like, yeah. let's have a blackout Friday where there's no Slack, no Zoom, no email. And just people can kind of manage all of what's happening. And, and our CEO was like, yeah, do it. Like very little pushback, which is, you know, one of the reasons I joined ProxyClick is, is for that kind of leadership. Um, so it, it focused things, we were able to do a lot. Some of the challenges that, that, that are non-obvious, I think it's been just trying to navigate the constantly shifting landscape of this. As I mm -hmm. said, in the beginning was in, very intense, but very adrenaline fueled about what you needed to do right then and there, quite crisis management. And you could talk about well-being, and you could do that Blackout Friday. And then you reach a point where you're unfortunately kind of normalizing this, or you, you feel that you need to sort of normalize a bit of it in order to to cope um so we opened our offices in early july at least in brussels as a resource we didn't force people back but we said for those of you that really need that space and to go to we'll open it up and we had to make it safe so transitioning from all these different stages to then the summer where things felt a bit more free um and then yeah people asking when do we come back do we go back what's the right call on that and and I don't have a crystal ball, you know, so we're all figuring it out and, and kind of trying to listen to contradictory advice coming from governments and different cities and different regions, recognizing that our New York office was, is pretty much now where we were in April and trying to navigate all the different sentiments around it. Mm -hmm. That's been really hard to stay ahead because the people are asking you, where do we go from here? And, and it's not like you have extra information. So it's, it's um, the judgment call has been very heavy. And again, in a big company, you have a lot of resources that are maybe able to feed you with information, but in a small company, you don't. So you, you really have to kind of take the bet. I think that's been um, very hard. Managing the longer term effects of, of people's well-being, of burnout, that's been tricky. And I think one that's coming up more recently is we've tried to be really understanding about how this is affecting people's lives on top of other things going on in the world that's affecting people's lives. Um, and at the same time, you're running a business, right? At the same time, you're trying to grow a business. You're trying to be performant. You want your people to be performant. And I know there was a moment in time where there was a lot of HR literature about don't do your performance reviews right now in a time of COVID, which I totally understood. And at the same time, as this continues month after month after month, you have to you have to balance the, the fact that people are at work and they need to be connected and they need to have purpose and they need still feedback. So that's been tricky, and I and I hope we're getting it right. Um, where we are now is the impact that this has on culture because I think again everyone was like remote working is the future. This totally works, and now you I think you can feel that from a cultural point of view, it's harder to maintain that connection. It's great for productivity, but maybe not good for longevity around culture. So I'm right now, my, a lot of my focus is how do you, how do you keep proxy click this culture that people know and love? How do you get people to stay connected when you are robbed of a lot of the obvious things that you can use? You know, proxy mm -hmm. click, we have a really exciting remote working trip that happens every year where the whole team flies to one location and they kind of work together. And it's, it's huge mm -hmm. for people. It fuels them for like half a year. Yeah very unlikely we can do that this year and so it becomes interesting what is your culture when you can't rely on those indicators anymore 
Mm-hmm. So that's that's a non-obvious thing that comes up when you're navigating the pandemic. No, completely, completely, yeah. And uh, and obviously, um, there's still a lot of uncertainty with how this is going to uh, you know play out. And so, um, do do you have a like a a, a medium term plan in terms of are you continuing to be remote first or are you a bit at a, a bit of a hybrid right now? Yeah. So the first thing we're trying to do is is time bound these things. Indeed. So. We can't see the total future right now, so we're so to not feed false assumptions. We've sort of said this is the plan from now until the end of this calendar year, and then we'll revisit. And, and what we've basically said is, first of all, we listen to whatever our local governments are telling us to do. That that's important to say um, that we support all of that. Uh, look, bearing in mind, we're looking at probably four or five different governments because of where we have people based. Um, and what we're saying is, we're encouraging people to find a way to, if they can, uh, spend a bit of time in the office because it's our belief that that balances out that transactional, what am I doing here risk of working with the need to feel connected and purpose and engaged and like you wanna still be doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're not forcing it at all. We have people that will wanna come in more because that's what they need. And we have people that do not feel they can do that at all and that's okay. Um, the office is a resource. That's kind of how I'm thinking about it today. It's a resource for those who need it. And I think even for myself, I, I'm trying to go once a week and it, it, it feeds you something. It gives you something. And so we're trying to remind people that people don't like rules. So when you mandate people to come back to the rule itself, doesn't feel very nice, but if, if they can, they have a responsibility to themselves to figure out what the right balance is to stay connected and to feel that they stay safe. And we kind of trust that judgment, but they need to make, calibrate that. Also, we're heading into winter. There's gonna be less daylight. It's, you know, yeah. the summertime, it's it's easy to kind of get your vitamin D and feel really plugged in. That's gonna get harder as we get into the winter. And so an office can, can depending on that office, of course, help you feel like, yeah, I'm part of something. And so that's why we're encouraging it, um, not because we are interested in taking attendance. Definitely, yeah, I think, uh... Yeah, of course, the office, as you say, you know, just creates a, a, a hub for those, those um, you know, many of those spontaneous connections. And you just don't, do not get that same experience over Zoom, um, which is uh, yeah, the, the difficult thing to replicate. Um, so shifting gears slightly, um, can you tell me a bit about your team structure? Um, so as, a, you know, as, as obviously the leader of the, the, the people function, um, what does your team set up look like at ProxyClick? Um. So it, I think it's almost the largest team I've ever had in a, in a scale up. I'm quite used to having to do a lot of it by myself with some incredible interns or office managers, such as the nature of, of startup world. Uh, so, but here uh, we have a team. So first of all, we're, because we're based out of Belgium, um, we have quite a nice, hefty social labor regulation. So we have someone who's really helping us navigate that, which is great because they're an expert in what they do and it allows me to focus on um, activities I'm better suited to do than understanding kind of labor regula- regulations but that's obviously we have someone that's kind of takes over more of the HR operations and I have someone who is really spearheading our talent acquisition effort um, again I'm used to having to do it all so it's been such a luxury in a way to have someone who's fully focused on on growing the team imagine. And really thinking about the people coming in and working with the managers to make sure that process is happening um, there's me that kind of covers from a like a senior point of view all everything in between also because we're building a lot of that stuff and so it's architecting it uh, and then I have sort of two members in my team that are really there to help us execute of course in terms of getting stuff done, but also in some ways um, have a relationship with the people in a way that that is harder for me to get to. As, as you get bigger by nature, this, this big job title you carry means people become more like oh, about you and they don't feel, you know, there's that hierarchy. It's kind of hard to avoid that hierarchy as much as I don't like it that it's there, but my team are kind of ambassadors. So they're, they, they can kind of go out there and be seen differently than I can. Um, but we're not a we're not a large team, but we're not a small team today. Okay, interesting. And um, and so a, a quick question about uh, career advice. Um, if somebody came to you and uh, and asked the question that they um, were thinking about jumping into their first role as uh, as a head of people, 
Um, how, how would you advise that person as to, um, you know, what to look for in um, a type of business to join? How would they know if it's the right time for them to take on that role um, and so on? That's a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer. I, I think you want to look at the culture of that company and, and feel how much it really resonates for you personally. And I think you have to take a good hard look at your CEO and not just, I mean, assuming you report to the CEO, but you might not, mm -hmm. but just taking a really good hard look at your leadership and saying, is this someone who, you know, traditionally we used to say, well, give me a seat at the table. Um, but is this someone who's going to listen to me? Who's going to challenge me um, where I feel we can really have that rapport? I think that's a huge, huge part of it. Um, if you want to do the role the way you want to do it, because if that's not aligned, it, it's, it's, it's constantly going to come kind of destabilized for you. I think um, head of people role. Yeah, I don't, I think, um, It, it, it so depends on the situation, if I'm honest, right? Like it depends if you're talking about a group of 30, 40 people, or if you're talking already about a group of 100, how that's going to look and how close you're getting to everything. Um, I would say, think about your ability to unlearn. So everything you knew, especially if you came from a larger company, how good are you at stepping away from that and breaking that down? Um, so again, I'm focusing this more on kind of scale up. How good are you getting your hands dirty, your elbows into the grease and really hands on, but also being able to zoom out. So to be able to zoom in and zoom out becomes really important. And, and the, the ability to context switch is really important. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And um, and so let's talk, talk a little bit about um, where you see HR heading. Um, and I know obviously you mentioned uh, you know, don't particularly like the phrase HR, but uh, <laughs> as a... Uh, you know, as a, um, as, as a broad field, um, what are some of the trends that you're most excited about? It's a really interesting question because I think I've been very lucky that even from the beginning of my career at Goldman, where I was, I was privileged to see HR work in a very advanced way. You know, they were talking about 360s and competency and diversity, equity and inclusion a good, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So for me, that doesn't feel advanced. But as I've, as I've kind of evolved in my career and stepped outside of the, the Goldman Sachs bubble, I realized that that isn't the case for, for lots of other companies. So, but in, in terms of where I think it's interesting, I know for a while, the big thing was HR and data, data-driven, data-driven, which I get. But again, when you're a small company, that data, you, you need a lot more data in order to be insightful. I think if you're small, if you can, you, you know it by the people, not by the data. And I feel like that HR data thing, it's important certainly for larger companies, but I don't think it fully substitutes what a people professional really brings to the mix, which is more the art and the emotional intelligence side of it. And I don't think data substitutes that at all. And if anything, more and more leadership, people experience emotional intelligence becomes the thing. And that I don't, data can help Maybe you refine that or know where to focus it, but it doesn't do it for you. Uh, trends aside from that, I think the, you know, my role often today is, is glue or another way to think about it is, is, is advisory. I really sit with managers and we, you know, I'm there to internally coach. I'm there to internally coach the CEO. I'm also there to internally coach the new hire who's trying to figure the place out too. And I love that. So I love these people roles that where we really get to partner with the people to be them, their best selves and that you, you do it empathically that you know servant leadership all that kind of stuff that that's really exciting to me um you know in the old in, in my time before it was always like there's a manager job and then there's like the hr job and that's probably right from a theoretical perspective but if you're thinking very pragmatically sometimes the people role is really in there with the manager and that's it's a delicate balance i don't think one should replace the other but it's really a partnership so that excites me when roles start to really be taken in that way and, um, you know, there's this uh, Claude Silver. She's the chief heart officer for VaynerMedia. She's always on LinkedIn. Yes. Uh, I, find, I find her refreshing to listen to. I, maybe, I don't always know how that works practically, but I find that a good North Star for me also in terms of HR trends to think, to not feel so apologetic about heart-driven leadership or mm -hmm. um, just that, that desire to have people have a fulsome experience not at the cost of your business performance, but I, you know, I grew up in an area where, you know, 
HR wanted to be credible to the business. He wanted to be seen as business people. And that sometimes yeah. meant suppressing that emotional intelligence side. And I'm very excited that today I get to do roles where I can really leverage that and that that is in fact seen as a driver of commercial performance. Great, great. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, you, you touched on many, many important topics there. And, uh, and I'd also love to hear you talk a bit about um, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, as, as you said, you know, something that is, uh, you know, sort of a field that you've worked in on for um, many years. And when you joined ProxyClick, as an example, um, what are some of the things that you immediately look at and implement um, on that topic? So it was really interesting because it's, it's uh, one of the things I learned doing this work for a long time was if you can build the systems right from the beginning, it saves you a lot of pain when you realize you've forgotten it. So you can teach managers to manage well. If you can build your recruitment process so it's inclusive and meritocratic, if you can build your performance development, your competency criteria to automatically think about diversity, equity, inclusion, you start with the best possible circumstances. And if you just kind of blindly go along and then realize you've got a remedial issue to fix. So that was kind of always in my mind that if I have the opportunity to do that, that's something to think about. Um, so it was always there. And then, you know, George Floyd, Black Lives Matter that happened in June really accelerated this because our population is very engaged on this topic. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in our Slack world around it and a lot of interest and, and desire. And I, and I don't think I'd ever seen a company so engaged with wanting to see progress that, you know, you sometimes hear um, DEI professionals say, how do I get my, my people, my business in line with this? I had the issue of how do I how do I move fast enough to keep up with what people want to see? And how do I also make sure that we don't um, have a bandwagon effect of thinking that we solve the problem by this quick solution when I know that the answer is so much more holistic? So that was kind of the dilemma we had here. Yes, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> it is. It is. But I have to be honest, I felt quite incompetent in that moment. So uh, in terms of where we are today, a couple of things. One is, you know, we, we talked about it. We talked about it to people. I talked about it with our leadership. Um, but I also refuse to kind of react too quickly to it. We, we started with sort of a listening tour where we heard people out or we tried to really understand what the expectations were after the dust had settled a little bit from the high emotions around those events. And then the plan that was kind of always in my back pocket just got moved up a lot in terms of um, things we needed to do because we had the attention of people, which was great. Um, so we did uh, an inclusivity audit. So uh, we were able to get hold of it. It's, it's kind of out there in the Google world, the playbook of things companies should be doing based off best practice. And we audited ourselves. What do we have? What don't we have? What are we missing? So we do that. And, and we realized there's some quick things we needed to do, like a, a diversity and inclusion policy. I think it was always in the DNA, but maybe you know there was something for people coming to actually see a policy was really important. So we had that in there. Um, We've, you know, I'm increasingly looking at our, certainly on gender statistics, that's something that's relatively easy for us to measure. It's harder for us to kind of get into ethnicity, race, historically underrepresented groups, particularly in Europe, um, in terms of the rules and regulations around that. Um, and then the other thing I was super lucky to be able to do is we have a quarterly series where we've agreed we'll bring our community, our proxy community together to reflect and talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we just held our event two weeks ago where I was super fortunate to be able to call in some favors and have colleagues that I worked with before at Goldman who've gone on to work as, you know, diversity at Google or, um, you know, PVH, large consumer brands. They volunteered their time on a panel to come and sit with me and talk about um, DEI efforts in the workplace, the experience right now in the United States. And, and mm -hmm. that was for our people to, to engage with in a way that didn't feel driven by proxy click agenda per se, but just to have some knowledge and insight. And that was our first kickoff event for this quarterly series. And our commitment is every quarter we'll do some kind of connection point or intervention where we're talking about this mm -hmm. and the commitment that we're getting this right from the beginning. And I'll give you one example is we're, we're growing heavily in our product and tech world. As maybe you know, product and tech, it's quite difficult to find um, a lot of diversity in the hiring pool for tons of reasons. And um, I just raised the flag. I said, if we are growing in that area specifically, and if we don't pay attention and try to have, um, you know, a diverse pipeline there, 
we will dilute our representation of women. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing to realize because it's before mm -hmm. that moment. You don't want to be saying that when it's already happened and you're like, oh, how did we get there? Because how do you undo that? Yep. Um, so things like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's an interesting point that you make there. Obviously, um, these things have to be um, thought through very proactively before, um, you know, before, as you say, you're reflecting on the on the situation and realizing how did this happen? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Great. Well, um, Crystal, we, we touched on many, many uh, important topics. Um, I have, have one last question before we dive into some quick fire questions. Okay. Um, if you could have one wish uh, in terms of um, a particular HR problem uh, that could be solved, what would that problem be? I struggled with this question. Um... Can I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking, I feel like I, I think as much as I said that, you know, we're really partnering with managers, there's a lot I don't get to control. I mean, there's just so, I'm the chief of people experience, but there's so much I don't control. I'm a facilitator, mm -hmm. I'm an advisor, and sometimes I can make things happen, but I don't often hold that relationship or that decision in my hand. Some people think I do, but I don't. And so the, 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 if you, if managers could just really be great, truthful, authentic managers, I could retire, right? Mm -hmm. so I think that would be the magic wand. We wouldn't maybe need me if all the managers could really fulfill the huge ask that's on them. Interesting. And so, so really to summarize that then you're, you know, a lot of the challenge that you face is enabling the, the managers within your organization to also be great leaders and um, you know, be, be, be sort of like the, the empathetic leaders that are needed within the organization. Yeah, every, every manager should, should be an HR manager too. Yeah, excellent. That's a, that's a, a really good closing thought. Um, okay, a couple of quick fire questions uh, from, from my side. So um, is there a book that you would recommend that every, uh, every HR or people operations professional should read? Um, there were tons that I thought of. Uh, there was one book, uh, I think it's Adrian Hurwitz, and, and people always know the hard thing about hard things. That's the one everybody knows, but he wrote another one called What You Do Is Who You Are. And mm -hmm. it's a bit of a weird book in terms of the, the case studies he's doing, but what he, what he does is he's looking at cultures and talking about what drives that culture. And it's a really interesting reflection about how company cultures are made and what gets controlled. And um, it felt a little bit odd when I first started reading it, but a lot of it stuck with me in terms of how to understand, especially as you're scaling culture, um, things to bear in mind. So that's a good okay. One. Cool, excellent. We'll, um, we'll, we'll link to that in the, in the show notes. And, uh, and then the next question would be, um, is there a particular training that you have done that has been really impactful on your career? Uh, I would say three things really quickly. So one is very boring, but time management. Way back when, pre-smartphones, uh, I took a David Allen time management. And this is when you use paper to do everything. But that was a really key skill to understand how to prioritize your time. And I think there's modern day versions of that today using all the digital tools we have. But that was a good one earlier on to just understand how to prioritize what gets done. Second one, I, as I did a training with, um, I think it's Marshall Goldsmith where they talked about skill and will and understanding when you're talking about managing people and you're talking about performance, understanding that there's very simply as a tool, skill and will, capability and willingness. And if you can understand those things and adapt accordingly, um, that really helps with managing, coaching, delegating and all that. And that's something I've used and tried to help other managers understand because it's practical. It's, it's not too complicated, but it's useful. And the last one I think is, I'm going to say radical candor. I know sometimes it got a bit of a funny name in, in the world, but I think, you know, what the problem with empathy is it can become exact. What, what did she call it? I don't, um, it can be a disservice, even though you think you are going in with the best of intentions. And I think radical candor of being able to show the compassion for that person, but also part of that compassion means being really straight with the truth. Mm -hmm. I think that for me personally, that's been a really helpful way to balance my own like empathy quotient with what I need to do um, professionally. Excellent. And, uh, and then the final question would be, um, any other resources that, uh, that you recommend? Any, any other sources that you go to to make sure that your uh, skill sets and that you're sort of learning the most up-to-date information? 
So, you know, when you work in a scale up, actually, you, you really have to do it because there's no one internal to rely on. So I find myself kind of with an open ear in mind to a lot of things more than I maybe used to be. And that's everything from, you know, with all those quick little HBR, hard business review articles that you'll see, I'm constantly picking in. It's like two minutes of your time to read and kind of do a quick sanity check with yourself, maybe pick up an insight, but also, you know, um, it's kind of a recent discovery. There's all these sort of Slack communities that are out there for, for people professionals today. And again, from where I'm sitting, it's really helpful because you learn what other companies are doing, what other questions people are dealing with. And particularly now with, COVID, I, I think that global community out there, the open playbooks that are happening is, is really beneficial that you, 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 you would be silly not to take advantage of all that information that's there. Excellent. Well, Crystal, thank you so much. Uh, this has been an amazing conversation. I hope, uh, hope you've enjoyed it as well. Yes, it's, it's good to have some self-reflection sometimes. So thank you. I hope it's, I hope it's interesting for others too. I'm, I'm absolutely sure it will be. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of People Over Perks by Leapsum. We're available on the Leapsum YouTube channel and all major podcasting platforms so you can hit subscribe to receive each episode as it's released. We also have an email newsletter and a Slack community where you'll find great resources and discussions on how to build a high-performing, humane and diverse company culture. You can find the link in the show notes or you can head to the resources section at leapsum.com. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.